Hello and welcome to this uh, Wilson Center Kennan Institute event. My name is Matt Rojanski and I direct the Kennan Institute. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for the latest installment of our Global Perspectives series, uh, which today is going to take a closer look at UK-Russia relations. We'll be joined by the one and only Andrew Monaghan, a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and non-resident associate fellow at the NATO Defense College. Uh, Andrew is also soon to become, he's really quite a fellow, uh, a Kennan Fellow um, here with us at the Kennan Institute. It's been long delayed. He was selected for the fellowship uh, a year or more ago, and uh, COVID has, has finally, I think, uh, allowed it. Um, before we begin, I want to thank uh, the Global Europe Program here at the Wilson Center for co-sponsoring today's event uh, and remind you that you can stay up to date with everything that we're doing uh, via our website. In particular, take a look at our uh, blogs, The Russia File and Focus Ukraine, and a listen to our podcasts, Ken and X and The Russia File, which you can find on the Apple podcast uh, store, whatever you call it, and everywhere else you can find podcasts. Um, if you'd like to ask a question at any time during the conversation, including right now, uh, you can email Kenan, K-E-N-N-A-N, -N at wilsoncenter.org. You can tweet at Kenan Institute, or you can post on our Facebook page, uh, those questions will be passed along to me to read to Andrew, and it would help us a lot if you would put in your name and affiliation, uh, and of course, a question mark at the end of your question. Um, let me introduce Andrew now and then hand him the floor without much further ado. Uh, Andrew, of course, is a researcher and analyst in the field of international politics, but in fact, a Russianist uh, near and dear to my heart in the area studies uh, style with a preference for old-fashioned Kremlinology. I would say it's newly back in fashion, at least in, in recent years, Andrew. Um, his particular interests are Russian domestic politics, strategy, and biography, and he has written extensively on Russian grand strategy, UK-Russia relations, and the Euro-Atlantic community's relationship with Russia, especially modern deterrence. Andrew founded the Russia Research Network in 2006 and continues to serve as its director. Um, he's also a non-resident, as I mentioned, associate fellow at NATO Defense College and commissioning editor of NDC's Russian Studies series. And I should note that it was right after Andrew departed uh, his post at NATO Defense College that uh, I had an opening to serve there as a visiting scholar on Russia. I'm, I'm fairly certain I disappointed everybody uh, who had enjoyed the high bar set by Andrew before that, um, but I was fortunate to at least catch one of his guest lectures indeed on the Kremlinology subject, which was a great pleasure at that time, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to what he has to say today. Um, Andrew's had a great uh, many previous uh, fellowships and uh, distinguished academic positions. Let me just note a couple more highlights. Um, he has three books, Dealing with the Russians, out in 2019, Power in Modern Russia from 2017, and The New Politics of Russia, 2016. Um, his writing has been published essentially everywhere. Um, in English speaking, Russian speaking, and uh, beyond universes. Um, and his education began in history at the University of Edinburgh um, before graduating from the Department of War Studies at King's College London, um, first from the MA program with distinction and the Simon O'Dwyer Russell Prize in 2007, and then a PhD in 2005. So Dr. Monaghan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Matt, and uh, what a pleasure it is to join you, albeit virtually. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to coming to the Institute next year to, to join you in person. Thank you for the invitation to join you to speak today about, about UK-Russia relations, particularly though I'm, I'm really looking forward to our discussion and, and particularly the Q&A with the audience. Um, frankly, the bottom line up front, um, in, in, the, in the blurb that you had uh, Promoting the event, you asked whether tense relations are here to stay and what, 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 what might we expect. Bottom line up front is, yes, tense relations are here to stay for the foreseeable future. I think in an echo of the Russo-Japan relations session you had last year, there's the, this, an iceberg or a, a gateway problem that I think will keep coming back. And that, that really is the, the, the murder of Alexander Litvinenko in 2006, but of course, reinforced by, um, <clears throat> by events in, in Salisbury in the attempt of, in the attempted murder of, of Sergei uh, Skripal. There's little getting around these icebergs, frankly, however much I say over the next, over the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so, there's little getting around these icebergs. Um, and though, it, though there are more to the relations, I think we have to acknowledge that there is a deep, if not systematic, uh, systemic dissonance. And it doesn't appear that either side is actively seeking to change this. 
the real question, therefore, I, 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 to my mind, is how do we go about coexisting? And there'll be two set, two points to my two main parts to my remarks. Uh, the first is going to be an overview of the trajectory and key themes in relations. I think we have to acknowledge at the moment, I'll come back to this later, but there is almost a full house of, 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 of scandal at the moment between UK and, and Russia. Uh, UK senior officials and documents note that Russia is the number one or most acute threat. Uh, there is a, a spy scandal, another spy scandal underway. There are mutual accusations of, of, domestic, of interference in each other's domestic uh, politics. There are questions over energy security and so on, a, a full hand. It all feels very now, but I want to try and put it into context. And then the second part will be to, to conclude will be how, to, how we might think about looking ahead. I will keep my remarks tight to UK-Russia relations. I mean, we can, I suppose, in the in the Q and A, point to the fact that well, the UK and Russia have 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 discussed um, the Iran nuclear question, and there's a wide range of of potential questions. But actually, I'm going to try and keep it tight to the the UK-Russia strict, uh, strictly uh, bilateral question. Um, that does mean I won't cover some things in depth here. We can always come to them in, in Q and A if you if you um, if you wish to pursue them. Before I start in earnest, I do want to take advantage of the fact that I'm, I'm addressing the, the Kennan Institute and I'm, I'm, I'm joining in here with, with you, Matt, as the director. I wanted to use the opportunity to just to remind us uh, of something that's uh, taking forward a UK-Russia session to remind you of, of the relationship between Frank Roberts and George Kennan uh, in the immediate post-war um, uh, era just in, in, in Moscow. Both were in their respective embassies. Frank Roberts was in the British Embassy in, in Moscow while, while George Kennan was in the US Embassy. Of course, George Kennan with his, with his famous long telegram. Um, also bear in mind, please, that Frank Roberts sent his long dispatches at the same time um, back to London instead. And there was even accusation of collusion between Roberts and, and Kennan. Uh, with General uh, General Clay or U.S. General Clay saying that that Kennan's uh, long telegram was an example of the British line. So I am going to introduce a bit, a bit of Frank Roberts here. Some older Russia hands, Russia watchers will maybe remember the remember the uh, the name. This is not an attempt to rake over old coals and associate assert analogies or to try and say we must redo Roberts or or, or let alone Kennan. It's not a Cold War analogy. It's a platform for examining where we are, where we've come from, and a, a way of reflecting on some of the key questions that, that have been dealt with by our predecessors. And to give you an indication, what, what Roberts was looking at was how to handle a deteriorating relationship with Russia at the outset of a new era, the need for a long-term holistic horizon in, in, in addressing the, the question of Russia, and the question which is so prominent and so persistent among both London and, and uh, Washington discussions of whether Russia is acting strategically or tactically. All relevant and all good advice for now. As a result of, of Frank Roberts's uh, long dispatches, um, policy thinking about Russia was organized and made more coherent and was given a more global horizon. Uh, Roberts advocated firmness in dealing with Russia, uh, both in big and small matters, a formal correctness of being strong and looking strong with, with, no, sta with no saber rattling. Quite rightly, he emphasized there'll be no shortcuts, but also pointed out that British-Russia relations for 300 years have been maintained not unsuccessfully on the basis of distant realism between governments. And I think there's quite a lot here that we could, we could maybe reflect on. With that in mind, let's turn to the question of UK-Russia relations in our, in our post-Cold War trajectory, because I am going to take it back to the, to the 1990s. Let me just start, though, with this sense of, a, of where we are now, because the trajectory is one of increasing tension and decreasing substance at the same time. And currently we have a, a full house of a full house of tension. And for those who are interested in all the all the sordid details, it's, it runs throughout all the, the UK and the Russia media at the moment, and it's all over both the UK and uh, UK embassy in Russia and Russian embassy in UK websites. So we have mutual accusations of interference in each other's politics. Uh, recently, uh, Maria Zakharova had, has, has accused the UK of supporting uh, independent sources and bloggers and, and NGOs in seeking regime change. Uh, the UK has, has questioned the uh, democratic uh, credentials of the, of the elections in the Duma. We had recently in Moscow, uh, in, in, um, 
in Berlin, the, the, the arrest of a British employee in the Berlin embassy on, on, on charges of, of spying for Russia. We have mutual accusations of mu media infringement. Uh, Sarah Rainsford, BBC correspondent's uh, visa was, was not renewed recently, um, largely on the basis that the, the Russian uh, MFA says for the UK's, um, well, the UK's refusal to, to, to continue with, uh, with, with Russian visas for, for, for Russian media. Uh, we have the Pandora Papers, of course, uh, some concern in UK media about the, the extent of Russian donors to the Conservative Party. We have energy security questions now. So at the moment we have, as I, as I say, a, a, a very busy schedule of, of, of disagreement. And of course, for those who are following um, the media, uh, the, the military side, we had the question in the summer of, of HMS Defender in, in the Black Sea. The UK Embassy uh, on, on its website points out to the UK-US joint statement condemning the, the poisoning of Navalny recently, um, the recent joint statement. The, another statement on the anniversary of the MH17 shootdown and support to, to the Dutch and the Australians. Again, criticism for of con continued crackdown on Russian civil society and the shrinking space for independent civil society in Russia. I think you get the, the, the drift. This is all within the last three or four months. The Russian embassy uh, announced its utter indignation at an article claiming uh, uh, it was a Russian spy at the, the Conservative Party uh, conference recently. Uh, rejects uh, vociferously the US uh, the UK reaction to the Duma elections and considers laughable the accusations about a third um, a third participant in the attempt on on Skripal's life saying there is no concrete evidence this is all all against the background of rather vitriolic accusations across the media and the political foothills of each being the other's natural eternal or official adversary um, I won't go into all the, the vibrant quotes you'll you'll, you'll find them and, and we might publish them uh, in, a, in a paper subsequently. So this has been the substance, ladies and gentlemen, one of uh, UK-Russia relations, not since, not since 2014 and not even since 2012, I'm afraid to say. It's been, it's been the substance since the mid 2000s. And that's, that's why I think you know, this context is so important. You have to go all the way back to the 1990s to find military to military cooperation, for instance, dealing uh, with spent nuclear fuel and dismantling uh, Soviet submarine, nuclear submarines, port visits, retraining military uh, personnel for civilian life. Um, I think the pinnacle in many ways of UK-Russia cooperation came in uh, with the UK-led NATO expedition out to Ch Kamchatka to raise the, the sunken submersible AS-28, saving Russian lives, uh, which, which resulted almost immediately in Mr. Putin visiting uh, London uh, with numerous fairly major agreements signed. Uh, also in the 1990s through to about the early to mid 2000s, UK became the largest investor in Russia, about 15% of the total, with some thousand UK companies active in Russia. So a substantial political uh, and military and, and, and economic relationship through until about the, the early to mid 2000s. But really from 2002 to 2003, we see increasingly difficult relations. Uh, there is, of course, the, the, the broad shifts of, of governance, uh, disagreements about governance and values in Russia between London and Moscow, uh, the, the, Chechnya, the war in Chechnya, um, the, the attack on Yukos, and of course the shifts in parliament with liberal parties being uh, excluded from parliament or being voted out of parliament, however you seek to define it in 2003. Uh, you also have the uh, the persistent extradition question, which is where Moscow asserted that, that uh, Boris Berezovsky, Ahmed Zakhaev, and a number of others were being put, protected politically in London, rather than uh, rather than the London, London, the British legal uh, sphere, um, saying that they wouldn't get a fair trial in in Russia. So the extradition question, governance questions, all beginning, and then of course the disagreements over the war in Iraq, and, and so again, deep sense of of, of of dissonance already back in the early 2000s. Really, though, we look at 2006 as possibly the turning point. And I, I emphasize this because it's so persistent in our relations even today. You'll recall, perhaps in 2006, uh, not only the, the, spy, the, the spy rock scandal, um, but also and also the energy questions, the disputes between Gazprom and Naftohaz Ukraini, uh, which, which created a big uh, a significant tension between Russia and the Euro-Atlantic community more broadly, but including the UK. Um, Russian pressure on the British Council, uh, also around this time, and then the murders first of Anna Politkovskaya and then Alexander Litvinenko. 
this really there for me in 2006 is the moment where you have uh, substantive concern uh, in the UK and substantive de departure in, in ways, only intensified really by the Russo-Georgia war in 2008. Um, and then even the economic relationship suffering from the financial crisis. I think we should mention that in 2010 or so, David Cameron and, David, uh, and Dmitry Medvedev sought to, to establish a new footing. It's a good indication of how bad the relationship was. Sought to indicate a new footing. Uh, Ambassador Yakovenko was appointed, considered a, a heavyweight. Um, meetings at two plus two, foreign and defense ministers, high level visits planned and the, the, the advocacy of a prosperity or, and knowledge agenda. So as, as, the, as the British Foreign Secretary at the time said, William Haig said, it's not in the UK's national interest to be in permanent confrontation with Russia, and there is a desire to remove irritants. He also said, I make no criticism of the Labour government, the previous Labour government, for its poor relations with Russia, given the war in Georgia, Litvinenko and British Council. This new footing, though, uh, stalled almost immediately first on the, 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 the Litvinenko question, um, then on another spy scandal, uh, the accusation against the Katerina Zatuliveta, which was then, um, which was rescinded in some, uh, rescinded. Uh, but then, of course, also uh, developments in 2014, the war in Ukraine, and then the war, of course, in, in, in Syria. Again, also back to the question of, of political interference in the middle of the 2010s, mutual accusations of political, uh, political interference and military concerns. So really the point that, that Russia is, as is often point, as often said now that the Russia is a is the number one threat to the UK, emphasized and made clear in 2020 and 21, has actually been in, in the mix since about 2016. The UK has been a, a prominent, but some has had a prominent but somewhat ambiguous role in the Atlantic response to this uh, it, sin, since 2014. Obviously, hosting the Wales summit after the the war in Ukraine began, and 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 seeking to drive the defence of northeastern Europe, uh, enhance forward presence, contribution, and so on, uh, support for Ukraine, uh, support for sanctions on Russia. But this is not this was not a direct role. In fact, this was more engaging, seeking to engage the US on dealing with Russia, and also an attempt to engage Germany on in, in Europe on dealing with Russia. So what you have therefore is what was called David Cameron's backseat approach. Of course, in, in, in spring 2018, this changed with the, the, the Salisbury, uh, um, the attack in Salisbury on, on, on Skripal. And UK relations with Russia become much more confrontational, uh, taking a much more confrontational course. The attempt by London then to lead and more of an anti-Russian coalition, uh, call for comprehensive treaty to counter Russian disinformation, call for rapid response unit versus Russian malfeasance and cyber attacks and the like. So, so you see a, a much more um, a much more active role, particularly in the Euro-Atlantic area, against Russia taken by London in, in from 2018. Underlying all this were the uh, are economic relations, of course, and this is sort of what kept relations going in the 2000s, um, but actually playing much less of a role in 2010s. Um, it, it's true that the British uh, the economic relations had begun to recover after the financial crisis, so we're beginning to recover in 2011, 2012 and 2013, but not to pre-crisis levels. And the recent recovery over the last couple of years is not even to these early to the 2010s levels. So while there is, is a very limited and very narrow uh, political discussion, there is no, there is some economic relationship, but much reduced. This takes us to the question of part, part two, and it, we're left with a so what? We're left with serious tension, but, but little actual dialogue. Sure, it, it does exist. And, and recently a junior foreign minister went to, went to Moscow, but it's very limited. And it's focused on the acknowledgement of, I quote, profound differences. One of the reasons why I suggest that there is unlikely to be a, a, a serious thaw in relations is that each blames the other. And the willing, they both state willingness for reconciliation and development of relations, but expect the other to make the first move. Neither is likely to do this, given gateway issues. And the metaphor, therefore, I use is that, that London and Moscow are standing at two ends of a fairly long corridor, both saying that they would like to enhance relations and recreate relations, but holding their own door open and inviting the other to come down the corridor and through the door. And I, I, I don't see that happening. 
For each, the other is a low priority, a threat, yes, perhaps, a challenge, yes, perhaps, but not a strategic priority. London is, of course, busy elsewhere with many other priorities. Moscow doesn't seem to need London uh, for either dealing with the United States or with Europe. And the UK does not feature explicitly in any of Russia's strategic planning documents. So I think this will remain that, that, that way for the foreseeable future. What can be done? Um, to my mind, it's, I would say, essential to maintain some form of informal uh, track two dialogue. Um, second and beyond that, we can talk to building relations in a future agenda. Because I, I think we are facing, in some senses at least, some similar problems. We might look at, for instance, the questions of aging populations. It's often pointed out that Russia's population is in decline. This is certainly troubled, but but certainly the, the real uh, the real question is an aging population in Russia. We also have an aging population in the UK. The there are questions of urbanisation and, and and social socio-economic development in those uh, in infrastructure development. We also have questions of technology and the labor force. How will, how will evolving technology uh, shift, shift employment? All of these, I think, are common questions that could be, uh, could be at least discussed and thought through uh, between London and, and, and Moscow. This is all the more important because I think that despite neither being a, a particular priority, the overall agenda in Moscow and the overall agenda in Russia, in the UK, means that the UK and Russia are going to rub up against each other all the more beyond the Euro-Atlantic environment. If we are, if we are seeing the, the explicit advocacy, advocacy of a global Britain agenda um, and, and a shift towards the Indo-Pacific, we're also seeing what is tantamount to a global agenda Russia, a global Russia agenda uh, from Moscow. Uh, certainly Russia positioning itself as a ubiquitous power with interest in, in every region. And I think we're going to therefore start to encounter each other more and more in the global commons. Um, I think, for instance, we will encounter each other more in the, in the Indian Ocean, uh, the Asia Pacific region. And for instance, a subject that perhaps is, is, is worth looking into more, uh, Antarctica, where both are, uh, are, are interested. So this is what takes me back to Frank Roberts. And I think we see some of what Frank Roberts suggested already in action. Um, the idea in, in London for a longer term approach in a, in a, in a new competitive era I, it seems to me inescapable. We already see an attempt, I think, in London to organize, uh, to organize and, and bring together and make coherent a, um, a, an attempt to understand Russian activity and to deal with it in a cross, uh, a cross government way. Uh, this has been more and more evident since 2015, 2016. I think I would emphasize, though, the need for a, a more holistic view of Russian activity or as a whole. We do tend still, I think, to see Russia as a Euro-Atlantic state rather than as a ubiquitous one. I think also it would benefit more from seeing Russia as a strategic actor, not merely a tactical or opportunistic actor. And finally, in that sense, I think we need uh, in, in the UK, perhaps, and, and also in the US, and something that you and I might, might discuss, Matt, the sense of a slightly more sophisticated understanding through, through foresight of where we might be going with, with regards not only to our own interests, but with regards to Russia. And that foresight, uh, thinking of forecasting, will help to sustain a strategy that allows both firmness, uh, reciprocity where possible, and, uh, and the, the, the establishment of a stable modus vivendi. I'll draw my remarks to a, a conclusion on that. I'm, I'm afraid when I, when I speak on UK-Russia relations, it's always, uh, it's always a matter of bad news met by more bad news. And I always want to end up misquoting Yeltsin's a probably apocryphal statement when he was asked about the Russian economy in one word, um, good. Okay, two words, not good. Uh, the the, the UK-Russia relations one would be one word, bad. Okay, two words, very bad. And it's a, it's a source of sadness that we tend to go through these repetitive questions and repetitive disagreements. But I, I think that um, this is where we are for the next three to five years. Thank you very much, one and all, for your attention and for Matt for, for having me. I look forward to our discussion. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, that uh, good, not good, bad, very bad uh, really sort of captures uh, also the depth of our discussion about uh, relations with Russia in the broader West, uh, certainly in, in Washington, all, all too often, and that, that is not your approach, and it's one of many things I, I greatly appreciate. 
Uh, let me remind our viewers, you can uh, pose your questions by email, kenan at wilsoncenter.org, uh, tweet or Facebook. Um, but let me launch in with some, some questions of my own and, and some of the audience questions that have come in. Um, you know, uh, to, to use another one of these um, overused uh, lines, the, the US and the UK are often described as two countries separated by a common language. Um, and so I think there's a temptation uh, to assume that the factors that shape uh, policy, politics, uh, public attitudes towards an issue as historically important as Russia, um, for example, going back to the Cold War, are more or less in lockstep, uh, that, that the um, developments affect both, that is say both Washington and London in similar ways, that public attitudes evolve in similar ways, uh, that despite you know, the greater proximity, of course, between uh, the UK and Russia, uh, nonetheless, actually the United States you know, feels Russia as equally close, in fact, maybe even closer in many senses, certainly geographically that's true between Alaska and Kamchatka. Um, so uh, that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, the two would appear to be in de facto alignment for good or for ill across the board. But I guess I just wanna ask you, with the ruptures of the Trump and Brexit eras, um, both of which had some, I would say, pretty significant, at least public discourse elements that, that brought Russia in, um, is that still true that the United States and the United Kingdom are, are in lockstep? Was it ever true? Thank you. Yes. Well, it did occur to me to be a little bit cheeky at the beginning to ask whether you had the interpreters on here for, to, to interp my, interpret my, my British understatement into, into a very clear and explicit American statement. Um, it's really interesting what you raise here, because I, one of the points of the roberts Kennan relationship is, is very much that we need to link in with the US here. There are two very different sets of relations between Russia and, and the UK or, or the British Empire as it was really at the time and, and Russia and uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. And although both were working together very closely, both were sending slightly different messages back because, because the, the, the relationship was slightly divergent. And one of the important points from, from London's point of view was we have learnt as much about Washington's approach towards the Soviet Union as we have about the Soviet Union. So there's a really interesting little uh, matrix going on here, I think, about this. It's certainly true that, that the US and Russia are um, perhaps closer geographically. I, I would say the counter to that is that the UK and Russia have, have older relations. And there's, there's always been that kind of you know, interaction, as I said by um, quoting Roberts, you know, for, for 300 years, we've had this sort of this, this distant but realistic relationship with, with each other that actually ties us in quite neatly we have a in theory we have quite a, a sophisticated understanding of each other I'm, I'm i'm not sure that that's absolutely true over the last decade um do i think that the uk and the us are in 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 de facto alignment uh, i think we do have a series of closer uh we do have a number of similarities towards russia yes in terms of uh, the question of uh, values approach particularly uh in terms of challenge to democracy uh, in terms of, um, I, I think also we're going to find it in terms of, of of this wider global approach as well. I think the UK and, and, and the US are going to find themselves bumping up against Russia in unexpected places, uh, as I say, the Indo-Pacific and, and global commons more, more broadly. So I think we do, and I think we're low, we, we, we may have slight differences, uh, for instance, Running freedom of navigation operations in the Black Sea, it may look like it's one, you know, a British vessel there, but I, I, I think we have similarities. That freedom of navigation is going to be something that that unites the UK and, and the US, um, and and brings that into the Russia question. So I do think there are factors of alignment. Of course, there are just you know dissonances that that, that would and should be natural. Um, I am I am less sure. I must say, and, and some of the audience may disagree, and I know that some of my, my friends and colleagues disagree. I am less sure that Brexit was a, was such a big change for the UK in terms of dealing with Russia. Now, there will be specific technical aspects, yes, 
Um, there, there are certainly, um, you know, there's one or two economic aspects, that's true. But actually, I'm not, I'm not sure that the substance has necessarily changed. As I mentioned, we've had this, this, this difficult relationship beforehand, a difficult relationship after Brexit also. Um, and uh, the, the broad line that we often hear is, you know, we, we mustn't go back to business as usual. Well, you know, business as usual before Ukraine was bad also. Um, it, it, there's not some sort of 2014, 2016 sort of era where everything changes. Uh, so I, I think we're going to have a relatively persistent trajectory on this. Um, and I'd like to think that actually the US and the UK can, can, can forge something, uh, a relatively coherent uh, agenda together, yes, on this. You know, I think you, you, in effect, just anticipated this question, but I think now is the time then to put it to you. Um, you mentioned the importance of democracy. Um, I think it's not just democracy. It's, it's a whole host of concerns about essentially what happens in Russia, sometimes couched in terms of, well, what happens in Russia if Russia turns more authoritarian, that necessarily has effects on the region and the world, et cetera. But essentially, a, you know, a, a stated concern about the way that the Russian state treats its own people, um, you know, that seems to be fairly widespread in the West. Um, I, I, I wonder if the same phenomenon occurs, though, in UK-Russia relations as often does in, in US-Russia relations, which is that it confuses the Russians. They don't understand why we purport to care so much about this. Um, what we actually mean, because they make this counter argument that, well, you know, look at all of the cases in which you don't care, um, your happy partnership with plenty of authoritarian, non-democratic countries. And, uh, and then also this, this argument, I think, that gets a lot of currency now in Russia, which is that it's kind of a cover. It's, it's basically all a cover story for what's basically geopolitics. And when you see, you know, the United States and perhaps the UK along, along with us launching into sort of a new great power competition, um, it sure sounds like that. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, hopes. yeah. <laughs> okay. How long do we have? Um, right. Let me put it this way. The, when it comes to the question of Russia and, and governance within Russia, this is one of the first things that both, um, and let me just try to maybe make a distinction where there is a, a subtle one. Um, both UK politicians and UK policymakers together think that have thought that for, for the best part of 20 years. So, I mean, it, it's, it's where, and this is partly the, 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 the difficulty that any, any government that has come in over the last, well, okay, the Cameron government, when they, when they tried to put it on a new footing, there was considerable uh, political opposition to this in in the parliament and and across the the, the the wider public sphere, on the basis of um, on the basis of not just Litvinenko but also Russian uh, Russian democratic um, well at the time what we called sort of rollback of democracy if you you remember the um, you remember as, as things there was hope for democratic development in Russia under under Yeltsin and, and very early uh, early Putin and then then we moved into this idea of of a rollback or democracy under pressure and then we've moved into this more more sort of uh, concern about this more authoritarian line so for the UK it's very much a persistent question that the UK body politic does look at, at Russia through how it treats its own people yes and I think that's that's not going to change any time soon does it confuse the Russians? Yes, and I'll take you again. I apologize for sort of using some of these examples from, from further back, but I think again the point is to show it's not just it's not just news, this is this is systemic. This was exactly the argument with regards to the extradition cases uh, against Berezovsky and Zakhaev and, and, and others, um, where the where Moscow was was absolutely clear in its own mind that this was not legal question, this was a political question. So yeah, I think it, it, it does and, and can confuse relations. Um, I think you raise a very important point and one that I, I also try to, to, to advocate here is that we tend to look at this as a democratic stroke authoritarian question, whereas the, uh, in terms of the global power or great power competition, whereas the Russians have seen this, uh, let, let me just say, 
I, I appreciate it's arguable and I, I probably could argue it further as well, at least since the mid 2000s as, a, as an emerging geoeconomic competition. So I, I entirely sense this, this point of that the Russians look at, 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 a geo, at an emergent geopolitical competition and we look at it as more of an ideological competition. And I think that's something that is worth, worth exploring in, in greater depth. For instance, um, Nord Stream, uh, opposition to Nord Stream is entirely viewed in the, the basis of, of, of geopolitical concerns. If one reads the energy security strategy or the, the energy strategies and so on over the, last, over the last decade, this has been very clear about US competition for Russian markets, which poses a threat to the, to the federal budget, um, and therefore it's a national security question. So I, I very much think that, yes, there are, there are plenty of people in Moscow that see this as a geopolitical challenge, whether it's Gerasimov or whether it's in the energy sector or whether it's elsewhere. Um, and I think that's one of the, the challenges that we'll have to try to, um, well, try to understand first and then, and then, and then deal with second in, in the Frank Roberts way of, of reciprocity and firmness um, while transmitting our messages coherently. That, in fact, might end up being the right policy prescription for a whole host of problematic areas where we fail to communicate effectively, let's put it that way, uh, with Russia. Um, one that seems to be a, a problem on both sides of the Atlantic, but I would, I would say particularly acute, uh, which Morgan asks about, um, is the fact that London is still a favored destination for Russian money, um, and I think in particular gray money. Uh, so the question is, why hasn't the British government done more to crack down on the laundering of Russian money in the country? Um, and, and I think you might also address alongside that whether, whether you consider it to be gray or no, the presence of quite significant Russian money in Britain for a very long time. Uh, even if it's, if you will, sort of gone gone legitimate nowadays. Um, it's a it's a very good question, Morgan. And it's one that definitely deserves an answer. It's a very British response to it because it's a question that does deserve an answer. Why is this the case? I mean, I can assure you that this is a question that's raised by uh, raised repeatedly in the media. Um, it's raised, uh, it, as I mentioned, the Pandora Papers, I think, I mean, I, I did skip over it relatively quickly, but I, I mentioned it. The Pandora Papers are, are some of the, the, the leading lights, I don't mean the scandal mongers, the leading lights were saying, you know, this is a concern because it suggests that, that, that Russian donors, there are Russian donors to the Conservative Party. So, and, and you'll perhaps recall if, if, if it made it to that side of the Atlantic, it might not have done, but um, that these are these are questions that keep coming up in parliamentary questions as well. Um, I'd like to give a more sophisticated answer to that, except for the fact that I think it's a very good question and one that should continue to be asked. Um, it, 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 it has to be added that it's not only Russian money. It's not a very satisfactory answer, but this is not just a question of Russian money. Um, you know, one could call it grey money or, 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 or various other um, or various other less diplomatic uh, appellations, but but it's it's not just Russian money. And it's one of the things that, in fact, uh, the Royal United Services Institute just published uh, today a, 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 pre, a, a short presentation on, on this. So it is something that is viewed and I'm not something I can give you much more of an answer on. Uh, no, that's uh, quite understandable, Andrew. And, and your point about not just Russian money is, is on the one hand, well taken, but on the other hand, you know, just underscores the nature of the problem for the UK. Yeah. Yes. Um, we've anticipated one of several questions uh, asked by your soon to be colleague at the Wilson Center, Lucian Kim, uh, who is a Wilson fellow and, uh, and former NPR <coughs> Moscow correspondent. Um, but he also asks uh, a couple of questions that I, I'm just gonna go ahead and pose both of them yeah. I hear it in, a, in a way they're, they're parallel. Uh, first, you identify the Litvinenko poisoning as a watershed moment in relations. Why did the Kremlin think it could get away with this attack? And doesn't the Skripal poisoning just re reinforce the impression that the Kremlin doesn't really care about what Britain thinks? Uh, parentheses, it's often said that the Kremlin would never try to assassinate any Russians living in the US. Uh, in that vein, the Kremlin likes to paint the UK as an American vassal. What is your thinking about the Defender incident in the Black Sea, the HMS Defender incident, 
and how much was this coordinated with the U.S. and how risky was it really? You actually sort of uh, gave a head nod to that earlier. So if you could take both of those, uh, Andrew, together, that'd be great. Uh, yes, it's of course it's a fairly. I mean, it's not a, not a, an accusation limited to to Moscow to say, well, you know, London's just Washington's poodle and so on. I, I think that that's probably a little bit harsher. There may be others that think think the same um, that that it is a, a poodle of, of of the UK of the US. Um, it's interesting that the, the defender institute is uh, the defender incident is brought up in this circumstance and my understanding is that this wasn't terribly well coordinated with Washington so it's a it's a good indication of uh, uh, of something that, that London sought to do on its own um, whether it worked or not um, whether it achieved the ends that, that London might have wanted for it is perhaps a different question uh, it, but it doesn't seem to have been terribly well coordinated either as far as I can tell from the outside either with NATO or with the US um, some of the other aspects that, that, that London is, is engaging in, um, London is, is quite keen and very actively supporting uh, Ukraine at the moment. Um, these, are, these are perhaps seen to be in line with US policy. You'll have a clearer view of whether that's actually US policy or not. Um, but, and, and then also there is the question of, of London, dare I say it, pursuing its own interests uh, with this global, global Britain agenda. Uh, that is a post-Brexit line, and that is a one that is very much under debate here. But the integrated review is aligned with, but but independent of, I think the um, the US, and attempts to try to create British influence in coordination with the US in in not just in the Euro Atlantic in, environment, but also in Indo Pacific and or Indo Pacific as well. So yes, of course, there is this line that that. That the Kremlin paints the UK as a as a as a US as a US vassal. Um, I think that's probably a little bit overwrought, uh, but certainly has parts of, of validity to it. Um, well, look, when it comes down to Litvinenko as a watershed, don't forget it's Lit it's Litvinenko alongside the variety of other things that I put there. So alongside the energy crises, Politkovska, uh, British Council. So 2006 was really the, the, the moment where across a whole range of different issues, there was uh, the spy scandal, as I mentioned, where there was a number of different things going on between London and, and Moscow. Why did the Kremlin think it could get away with it? Well, um, because it used a series, it used a, uh, a method that was um, supposed to be undetectable, as far as I could, as far as I can tell. And it was by, it was not. It, it was by 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 dint of, of, of very good medicine and, and good fortune that, that actually the, the 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 source of this was traced, and then it was traced back to Russia. Um, I would be a little bit careful also of saying that 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 Moscow just carries out assassinations in 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 the UK. I I'm not sure that this is. Uh, I, I think we would need to go into this in rather more depth. I think that there are other people who have suffered at the hands of uh, other people who might fall into this category further across the world. Uh, you would you would know more about um, assassinations in the US, assassination attempts in the US. I don't want to particularly get into that. But why did they think they could get away with Skripal? I think that was a an attempt to mete out punishment and deterrence. It's a very sore subject. It's a very explicit and difficult and emotional subject, which 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 I think. Uh, enraged significant parts of, of the British government and population um, that they thought they could get away with it. Uh, do I think that the Russians will be deterred by the activities subsequently? Um, I'm afraid to say I probably don't think that they will be deterred by that, no. If, if there is an attempt, if, if Russia really wants to pursue its own, Moscow really wants to pursue its own interest and it has an explicit interest, um, I point you to the Yandarbiev case um, in Qatar, uh, but there are there are other other examples where Moscow will pursue its interest if it deems it to be in uh, sufficient um, sufficiently important. So, uh, unhappy answers to both of those questions from a British point of view. I want to perhaps um, pull a little bit more on on Lucian's thread <clears throat> on the uh, the assassinations question, um, but also a version of the uh, of the, the Russian money question that he posed about just how frankly, just how much the Russian elite seems to care about London. Um, but, but it's really a Kremlinology question, which is there has long been uh, a presumption, which you're free to disagree with, but, but I, think, I think fairly widely held by those of us who, who watch Moscow, that a 
a Russian policy that would in some way uh, impact the relationship with the United States in, in some significant way, um, you know, impact the, the sort of nuclear superpower dynamic would have to be decided at the very highest level. Um, is it the case, is there essentially a lower level at which the kurirushi within the Russian uh, you know, decision-making structure for the UK uh, is, is not Putin himself or is not you know, the very highest level? Is, is it different uh, because of just how much interaction uh, there is, uh, you know, I could name, I could name, I mean, Shuvalov, right, famously has an, an apartment in London. I, I, so you get what I'm asking, sort of how does, how does the decision making within the, the Kremlin black box work when it comes to the UK? Well, it's a, it's a, um, I think a very good question, not least because if we're saying that there's a lot of Russian money in, involved and some senior Russian figures here, you're already answering the question that actually senior players are involved. Surely, I mean, if we're saying that senior players have, you know, have senior figures have have money here and have interests here, then will they get a vote? Um, a vote might be a different thing in the Russian chain of command, perhaps. Um, but yes, I think if there's going to be a strategic response to it from from a UN security uh, UN Security Council permanent member, then uh, most decisions probably do end up getting pushed up to the to to the to the team to the team. Um, because as you as you will know, and I, I will I will just make it explicit what I'm saying here. Uh, I think there is a collective Putin. Um, this is something that I I would argue for some have argued for some time. What well, was originally called in by by Russian media the, the the collective Putin. This is not Putin's Russia. This is there is a collective Putin. Um, I I must say I I would rather not get drawn into the easy easy throwing. You know, did Putin sign it off? I mean, I don't know. And and unless there are people here with with extremely privileged information, we don't know either. Um, is it something that that he was president? Is it something that happened when he was president? Yes. So we're we're stuck between a, a, a bit of a spectrum here. Um, and could I actually add in add in a third? Well, we had to deal with the problem. Um, it, it seems to have gone wrong, Vladimir Vladimirovich. Uh, you know, don't suppose you could close ranks and 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 make sure those those Brits don't don't catch us. I I can fully envisage that a chain of command question doesn't work quite as easily in Russia as people think it does. Um, so I realise that there are those three questions. If I if I had deep and detailed insight into uh, into the well, as I said, when when this happened in in the media and when as this happened in in March 2018, if I if I knew who had given the instructions to do what, I would either be much better paid than I am now, or I would be in hiding. Forgive me then for trying just a little bit to narrow the space in between. Yeah. Putin was president when this happened, yeah. and you know the tempting question of did he sign off? What you are saying is that the the interests of very powerful Russians who may or may not themselves be at any given moment part of the collective Putin, if you want to want to call it that, are engaged on the. I Ukraine. think so, and and therefore the highest level of involvement should be presumed when it comes to you know. <clears throat> dealing with the UK. Let me let me give you an example of uh, where this might be the case. Um, BP has a relationship with which organization? You may have heard of Rosneft. Yeah. Who's at the head of Rosneft? One Igor Sechin, as I recall. Yeah. Where, 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 where is he? Where is Igor Ivanovich? <laughs> Understood. I mean, do, do, do we want to do we want to think of any any others? I mean, we can probably name three or four others of you know heavy hitting Russian political figures. But let's let's go for goal. I'm not pointing any fingers or suggesting anything. You ask if if there are if there are people involved in UK interests at the top of Russian decision making. That's the question. Without accusation, without you know, this is a specific question. There's one. And if there are people higher up the chain than him. Good luck to them. Yeah, no, very, so, I, I think that's very that's very fair. I mean, so again, separate from from the the the, the questions of uh, you know assassinations or dirty money or just where where the, this is one of the tangible questions of well, one of the intangible questions of UK Russia relations is that the UK is nowhere in Russia's official strategic priority list. 
And yet, all of these people have significant interests in the UK one way or the other, economic relations or political relations or, or, or some such. So, or, family or, uh, or, or, or family or so on. So I, I think that, that when it comes to that question, we can say there is a certain ambivalence and a certain ambiguity to it. Um, that, that when, it when it comes to specific questions, then you would need to have uh, very specific sets of expertise and, and courts involved and, and other things, I think. Uh, let me uh, quickly touch on another question from a viewer. Emily Jennings uh, asks about the impact of the Crimean annexation, um, I think perhaps as distinct from kind of the broader Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, on relations between the, U the UK and Russia. Was that, was that itself a, a, a breaking point or just sort of more part of what you've been describing? <clears throat> For me, it's, a, it's, it's more of the, it's, it's, it, it put the, it put the skids under under any sort of, of return to a you know a, a new footing. It, it f finished that off. Even 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 by then, I think that the attempt to return to a new footing was uh, was under pressure. But but it immediately cancelled all 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 remaining points of 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 interaction. So I I I don't see 2014 as the as the key the key hinge in this. I, I think it's uh, for for me the two dates are the two key dates are. 2006 and 2018 and um, 2014 is a is a is certainly an important moment no one would argue against that but that's that's already uh, part of yet another set of of, of disagreements um, between London and Moscow and and I think we can you know we can be be very explicit that that London is is continuing to support I mean, it does on the on the on the embassy website there's very specifically and explicitly a statement in support of of Ukrainian sovereignty um and the HMS defender incident was supposed to be along those lines also uh, the visit of a uh, ministerial level visit to Kiev is is more good examples of 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 this attempt so undoubtedly that the, 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 the it's an important one but analytically I tend to put 2006 and 2018 as the as the real points in this over the last generation if I can say, Andrew, and, and this is certainly a subject for further discussion, um, perhaps next year, uh, when you're in Washington, that that itself answers the question of where there there is some difference in the London and the Washington, mm -hmm. because there's no question that the key dates in, in, in Washington are 2014 and 2016, you know, yeah. invasion and, and annexation yeah. uh, in Ukraine and election interference. I mean, far and away. Those are the issues that um, ended the reset period definitively, which yeah. of course the UK didn't have, uh, even no. was, uh, in, in some sense observing. No, I mean our our new footing it was was not was an echo of the reset, but you know I, I I and I'm sure there are lots of people you know if there are Brits who are who are on the call say no 2014 was important. What are you what are you saying? Uh, don't get me wrong, it is an important moment, but it's not. It's not quite so structural as uh, as everything else. Certainly, all remaining contacts were were, were you know were cancelled, and you know the, the attempt to rebuild the relationship was 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 stifled. And uh, um, but let's not forget the the serious impact that Litvinenko had had on our our relationship already. So um, I, I understand that that 2014 is also the the as I mentioned earlier, there was that attempt where. Where the UK sort of it hosts the Wales summit and drives enhanced forward presence and sanctions. So yes, there's lots of activity there, but but the point is that you'll recall my phrase: uh, David Cameron decided to take a back seat. It was not London driving, you know, at London specifically going to, um, to to Moscow to disagree as it was, you know, or disagreeing specifically directly with with Moscow. Um, in in many senses, the 2008 and 2014 were just good examples of this is why we have a difficult relationship with Russia. Here's more evidence. So 2006 for us, we don't. Of course, 2016 had a had a had an impact also on our own our own discussion too because. Uh, discussions in the US often 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 have their influence in the UK, uh, perhaps returning to Lucian's point. Um, but again, that that was that was an atmospheric change rather than a rather than a structural change. It was still UK as a backseat guidance towards facilitating and supporting the US in, in broader terms and facilitating and supporting Germany in European terms. Whereas come 2018, with the attack on, on Skripal, that was a London-led effort to, um, to achieve certain things. 
So for me, that that's why I that's why I make the difference. And and of course, you know, when when we say the dates make it differ different. I mean, I think the US and the UK are pretty pretty aligned in terms of of, of twenty fourteen. It it just wasn't the same date for us. I think I think London might have said to you, well, you know, okay, your reset has failed. I think some of us might have been suggesting that was due anyway. Yeah. So I, let, let, let me, if I can, take the last five minutes we have um, and shift direction, but to something that I think is um, acutely relevant as we try to figure out uh, respective strategies for dealing with Russia going forward. Um, you used the phrase, uh, which I believe was a, a quotation from the UK national defense strategy, Russia is the number one threat to the UK. Um, the United States has has used similar language in uh, congressional testimony by senior US officials in national security and national defense strategies. And Vladimir Putin is paying attention. Uh, he frequently now especially cites that language, cites the designation of Russia. He often uses the term of an enemy, um, though he attributes it to the other. In other words, he, he seldom initiates calling the US or the UK an enemy, and you know, he'll say troublesome partners. Um, but how much are we, in a sense, creating our own reality looking forward by handing Russia this, this cudgel to use principally in its own domestic repression uh, and, and in ways essentially cutting off our societies, cutting off Westerners from Russia, um, which is really, it seems to me, the most productive thing we could be doing now is, is, is building relationships between peoples. And yet by declaring Russia, the Russian state in this way to be an adversary, we essentially hand the Russian government the tool to shut down that relationship. And you know, we see that with the state of embassies and visas and so forth. Put a question mark at the end of that. That was too long and rambling, but but you know, final thoughts on this are yours, Andrew. Okay, well, thanks. I, I think this is a it's a very interesting question. I must admit, I'm not I'd not really looked at it in, in in quite the same way, and I might I will answer it by by coming at it from a slightly different angle, if I may. Because what we're what we're doing is we have, if we think when the, the language of of great power competition really came into prominence into policy documents, that was sort of 2017, 2018, give or take. I mean, I know that it was discussed before, and, and I know the specific language is under discussion now as the new I mean, Russia, Russia as a threat. The Russia as a threat. The Russia, the, long the Russia as a threat long predates that, but the, the sense of great power competition rather than demographic democratic rollback is really sort of 2017, 2018 formalized. And it's roughly the same for the UK as well. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that the Russians had already been talking about great power competition about a decade before that. If you just go back to Putin's Munich speech in 2007, there's a very good, good example. Um, so there's some out of kilter question there. And the Russians, even before this, have been talking about you know, our, our competitors in the West and so on. So I, I hesitate with, with, with the question of, of language of, of enemy and adversary. Um, that allows the Russians to, to do certain things. Yes, it, that's possible. From a, from a UK point of view, and maybe even more from a US point of view, I, I have a different response, is that we talk about this as Russia is the number one threat or as an acute threat or as a challenge. But almost all of our foresight and forecasting documents and simultaneously our senior officials start talking about Russia is in decline. Russia has no long term gain. Russia is simply an opportunistic state making stuff up as they go along. So we have a dissonance here, an ambivalence here, which you know, I'm quite, I'm quite, I think is really important to explore because at the same time as Russia is a challenge now, it's not going to be a challenge in five years time. This, in my view, is the prelude to surprise. It's a council for passivity, and it is going to lead to, I think, a very unhappy set of um, set of, of realizations come the mid 2020s, because what we're essentially doing with our forecasting, and I, I, I don't want to, what's the Russian phrase? I, I don't want to point fingers, but let's say it's in Global Trends 2040, um, is is essentially the scenarios that we paint of Russia are that in the mid to late 20s, because of socioeconomic problems. Russia on its own chooses reconciliation with the West and everything's happy, or it fades entirely from all of the other scenarios. It's just China, 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 and maybe one or two other things. What we're doing is we're mainstreaming here a, a black swan, and we're choosing that as our primary driver. This is, this is really a fundament for surprise 
because at least one scenario has to be Russia muddling through. And actually, if you look at some of the, 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 the power dynamics, you might even find that, that Russian power actually increases a little bit in the 2020s. So while we're calling Russia the, the adversary and the number one threat, we're actually drawing off from that in terms of our thinking about what to do about it. That's really why I'm pushing at, uh, at Frank Roberts and, and the Ken and Roberts idea of, of thinking about this. Yes, grand strategy. There is a strategy there. Yes, there are long-term considerations. Um, yes, this, we're entering a new era of, of, of long-term challenge that we have to think through. And I don't think that we're necessarily doing all those three things. So I, I don't disagree with your point about, about, about the Russian leadership cutting off you know, relations through its own people. And that maybe is a different different conversation but i would finish on this we talk about russia as a challenge and in decline at the same time and therefore confusing ourselves and setting ourselves up for a rather unhappy surprise more bad news and that's that's yeah that's close to close to calling time unfortunately no, that's, that's <laughs> i can't think well, of good news it's very well put uh andrew and, and puts me in mind of um what has just happened in afghanistan in terms of the way that um, just bury our heads in the sand about potential future scenarios, even even as the challenges were slapping us across the face, uh, you know, in the moment of decision. Uh, so your analysis is very well taken on Russia. Unfortunately, there are other questions that we didn't get to uh, about the British legal system and much more. One might have even asked about unique British perceptions of our friend and colleague Fiona Hill when she was in the top Russia policy role in Washington, but. That will all have to wait for uh, perhaps our Ken and Roberts seminar discussion next year. Um, and pleasure. Thank you so much for today's discussion. Um, congratulations on your upcoming fellowship appointment, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me, and I I really look forward to to, to joining you over there in, in in Washington in the not too distant future. Thank you for having me, and thank you all for uh, to to the audience for for your questions, your interesting questions, and and participating.